Hello, it's Rachel Anderson. I'm a naturalist here at Warner Park Nature Center and welcome to our virtual hummingbird celebration. We're doing this today in partnership with Metro Parks of Nashville and Davidson County and our friends of Warner Parks. And right now I'd like to welcome Laura Cook, our bird research coordinator, who is going to talk all about how we banned hummingbirds here at Warner Park. Welcome to the virtual hummingbird celebration. I'm Laura Cook. I'm the bird research coordinator here at Warner Park Nature Center. And we're really excited to share with you um, information about our long-term hummingbird research. But before we dive into the research, we wanted to show you how we actually banned hummingbirds. Before you can actually ban a bird, you have to have a federal bird banning permit, which is required by the U.S. Geological Survey's Bird Banning Laboratory to place a bird band or any type of marker on a wild bird that is protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. This band has a unique number and it is placed on the leg of the bird by researchers to enable individual identification. Being trained as a bander or banding assistant is a long process that can take years, similar to an apprenticeship. This training typically occurs under the guidance of a master bird bander. In addition, a hummingbird banding permit requires additional training and experience. At the Warner Park Nature Center Bird Banding Station, which was launched in 1982 by Sandy Bivens, we are lucky to have five federally permitted hummingbird banders. So why ban hummingbirds? It's important to remember that the overall goal of bird banding research is to ensure the long-term viability and conservation of birds. And even with a fairly common species like hummingbirds, where we can easily view them, there's so much more to learn. For most bird species, the gap in the life cycle information is during migration, when birds are moving from their summer breeding grounds to their winter non-breeding grounds and vice versa. Beginning in 2000, the Warner Park Nature Center Bird Program set out to help fill that migration information gap on hummingbirds. To do this, we banned from late July through mid-September when hummingbirds are migrating through Tennessee from as far north as Canada to their wintering habitat in Mexico and Central America. During this migration, Warner Parks provides a safe native habitat with nectar-filled flowers and lots of insects. This food source is critically important for migrating hummingbirds, which must gain fat reserves to make the long journey south, sometimes doubling their weight. So every time we band a hummingbird, we collect important information about the health, age, and gender. When that hummingbird is caught again or recaptured, we learn even more about longevity, survivorship, and fidelity. One example is a female ruby-throated hummingbird that we first banded here in 2001 as an adult. We then recaptured the same bird in 2002, in 2004, and again in 2006. We learned from these recaptures that this female was at least six years old and that she returned to Warner Parks each fall to rest and refuel on her long journey south. So how do we band hummingbirds? First, we have to capture the hummingbird. There are several trap styles and designs and a federal permit is required to purchase and use them. Once we've captured a hummingbird, the next step is the most important, identifying the hummingbird to species. Identifying the species is important from a science and data perspective, but also because each species of hummingbirds receives a precisely sized band to fit their tiny legs. The most common hummingbird captured at Warner Park Nature Center is the ruby-throated hummingbird, like this male seen here at one of our feeders. This is the only hummingbird that breeds in eastern North America. However, eight species of hummingbirds have been documented in Tennessee. For example, in 2015, we actually banded a rufous hummingbird in July at the Nature Center. Rufous hummingbirds don't breed here, they breed out west, but sometimes they can overwinter in Tennessee, which is how we were able to capture this one. But the vast majority of hummingbirds we banned are ruby-throated hummingbirds, and they're distinguished by their golden green back and head. And once we identify a hummingbird to species, now we've got to figure out is it a male or a female. And we do this because they often take different band sizes. Male ruby-throated hummingbirds take a slightly smaller band size than females. Adult males are fortunately very easy to identify because of their bright red gorget feathers. But 
Female and juvenile or first year birds are very difficult to tell apart. So we confirm gender by looking at the six primary feathers. Now that we know the species and gender, we'll go through the steps of banding this female ruby-throated hummingbird. The bander carefully places the female hummingbird in a small nylon stocking. This keeps the bird safe while she takes important measurements that we recorded on the data sheet. The hummingbird is weighed first. Males typically weigh 3.0 grams and females 3.5 grams. Weight is an indication of health and almost also how much fat reserves they've built up for their southerly migration. This bird weighs 3.67 grams. Next, the bander reads the band number, opens the band, and loads the band on pliers. She places the uniquely numbered band on the left leg. You'll notice the specially designed pliers ensures the band fits perfectly and does not harm the bird in any way. The bander then double checks to ensure the band is fitted properly. Using calipers that measure in millimeters, you take the wing length or cord measurement. Females typically have longer wings than males. Next, a soft plastic ruler is used to measure the tail length. Males typically have longer tails than females. She then uses the calipers again to measure the bill or the culmen. Females typically have longer bills than males. Finally, the bander uses a straw to gently blow on the bird. She's assessing several measurements. Does the bird have any fat reserves? A bird with fat weighs significantly more as much as doubling their normal weight. This fat reserve helps them make the, make the long journey to their wintering grounds. The other thing she's looking for is molt or feathery placement. So this bird had a, a fat reserve of one, which means she's just starting to build up some of her fat. And she does have some molt on her head, her throat, her back, and her belly. Then after the hummingbird is banded, it is released. We hope it'll be recaptured by us or another researcher so we can continue to learn more about these beautiful and amazing birds. So if you love hummingbirds as much as we do, what can you do to help them? We have several suggestions. First, put up hummingbird feeders. We recommend at least one feeder up year round in case you're lucky enough to have a winter hummingbird visit your feeder. Be sure to check out our videos on different types of feeders and how to maintain and clean them. Second, while hummingbird feeders are great, native plants are even better for birds because they provide nectar and insects which are a critical part of hummingbirds' diets. Third, keep them safe by keeping your cat indoors and making your windows safe. Did you know that every year a billion birds die 
because of window collisions. Luckily, there's some really simple solutions to prevent these collisions. The American Bird Conservancy is a great resource. Finally, it's important to support efforts that conserve native habitats and research efforts such as the bird program, which is fully funded by Friends of Warner Parks. We hope you're able to learn a little bit about hummingbirds and our migration research project. Thank you so much for joining us today.